start now and uh, good afternoon to all of you and uh, i welcome all of you for uh, this is a third day of this training program on on glaciers and remote sensing so today we will talk about uh, are i am audible now yes sir Hello. you are yes okay. So uh, today we will talk about the remote sensing of snow and ice. Uh, until now, uh, we, you had a couple of lectures uh, which talk about uh, general trend, general idea about climate change, overall idea about remote sensing, and then about the importance of uh, crisis here and the global distribution of cryosphere. So today we will talk about um, principle which is used for snow and glacier studies. So <clears throat> so the first of all, before going into the, um, the characteristics or spectral reflectance characteristic of snow and ice, which help us to understand various types of snow as well as oil, uh, as well as ice, it is important for us to understand how it looks like. And we will try to address why it looks uh, different than many other features. So this is a picture which you have seen earlier, but now I'm talking about quite different contexts. So this is a snow which is fallen on the ground immediately after the fresh snowfall, this picture is taken. You can see here, snow is extremely white compared to the other land features, particularly vegetation on which the snow cover is lying. So it is, snow is white in color. The, the color of the snow is significantly changes uh, up to certain extent as it goes through the process of uh, change. That means once it is fallen onto the ground, it goes to the, uh, it changes its various physical characteristics. That means it changes its liquid water content, it changes its density, it also changes its green size, as well as it's, it reduces its thickness as it uh, goes through the process of melting. So it becomes very patchy snow, and many times uh, the contaminants which is present into the snowpack, they get filtered out and comes from the patch comes on the surface because of the filtering processes. Uh, uh, so it is looks patchy and dirty snow and the, they and this snow has slightly lower albedo or reflectance than a fresh snow. Um, then if you really look in terms of ice, uh, when the snow gets converted into the ice, we will look into that processes, how snow gets converted into ice this is a completely transparent snow that means um, if in reality if you look into the snow pack so uh, it is uh, ice pack which is completely transparent snow when and that is essentially because the trapped air between the two ice crystal is removed and that space is really closed then it is called ice uh, with density is significantly higher and you can see it is a quite transparent um, uh, ice which it it becomes and if you really look into the glacier ice in the huge patch of ice you can see there how it looks like it is generally looks like if it is very clean bluish in tone uh, you can see ice um, because of the scattering properties but top of that there will be a lot of dirt which is sitting onto the ice so you can uh, you can really see that some places it is bluish stone, some places it is blackish stone because of the dirt. And sometime also because of the melting process, it, it also looks in white in color. So they have a different color. But when you see the glacier, because ice is one, one thing and glacier is another thing. So the difference between the ice and glacier is, glacier is a mass of ice which is slowly moving down the valley. But that mass of ice contains various other param features. That means there's a lot of debris on the surface. You can see there are some debris on the surface. 
Then there are uh, numerous landforms, creases are formed, and then there is snow on the surface. So it looks quite different than the pure snow or the way pure ice you will look like. Um, what you can see are their optical characteristics of that and that of the landform, which is a glacier, is a slightly different. So it is important for us to understand how snow looks like, how ice looks like, how dirty snow looks like, and how glaciers look like. Uh, uh, so this is important for us to understand differences between that. And sometimes what really happens is there is a significant amount of contamination onto the glacier ice. So this is a glacier ice which is in Sikkim. And when significant amount of volcanic activity taken place into the Iceland and there's a lot of ash or deposited on the snow, on the ice, creating very different color. And it can significantly enhance the melting of glaciers because of the reduction in the albedo of ice. So you can see that um, uh, the glaciers can have a different um, characteristics. Uh, they look very differently. And because of that, they have a different albedo and it, is, it can change um, changes the melting characteristics. So that is where it is important to understand. So le let us understand some of the differences, how we will uh, differentiate between snow, ice, and glacier. So what it really means is snow is a porous and permeable aggregate of ice crystal. Um, so it is a, a series of ice crystals um, uh, and that ice crystal are interconnected by air and water. So generally, if it is a dry ice, then there are small, small crystals are there. And in between, there is air in it. And if it is a wet, then it is generally um, uh, that space is occupied partially by the water. So generally, density of is, um, is, is less than 400 kilograms per cubic meter. So what will be the density of water? Uh, uh, so it is important to understand. Uh, so I will, um, uh, anyone can answer that question by sending on, um, uh, sending on, on chat box that what will be the density of water? Because we are talking here about the density of ice, snow, which is a, a less than 400 kilogram per cubic meter. Uh, so when what really happens is uh, because of the various processes, the interconnected air or water passages, because um, so you have crystals and in between crystals, there is a water or there is a, uh, there is air when it squeezes out completely. And if that air is re removed, most of the air is removed and that process by which because of the compaction the when the uh, when the uh, air is removed uh, that is called as uh, a sealed off process and or a pore close close off process and then ice is formed and once the ice is formed then its density is goes up significantly up to 830 to 923 kilogram per cubic meter uh, and then what happens in nature uh, in a high altitude region when the ice mass becomes a sufficiently large a huge mass uh, sufficiently large then due to gravity and creeping creeping because of the internal deformation what really happens is uh, creeping takes place and the glacier is formed however ice should be formed due to metamorphism and recrystallization of naturally fallen snow on the land of surface. And glaciers essentially have ice, snow, water, and debris. Um, so ice is an integral part of it, but it also has the snow, it has water, and it has debris. But the essential characteristic is it should be moving ice. It cannot be stagnant ice. And if it is stagnant ice, then it is a completely different characteristic. And if it is associated with the glacier, then it is called dead ice mounds or ice mounds or something like that. So it is different than glacier. So the terminus of glacier is 
uh, is really we have to realize it is a part of the moving ice. Uh, so that realization is really important and it will help you uh, for interpretation of this thing. So if you look into the typical density as snow goes through the process of motamorphism, uh, then it is a fresh snow which has around if it is fallen under the dry and calm condition, that means there is no wind and the temperature is substantially below the zero degree Celsius. It is not the wet snowfall, or it is zero degree Celsius, then there will be wet snow will be falling. If it is a fresh snow and dry uh, and it is a environment is calm, it is not windy, then it can have a fresh snow will have 50 to 70 kilogram per meter cube of uh, its density. Uh, if it is a damp snow, that means if it is falling under the condition where temperatures are close to the melting around zero degrees Celsius, then it has a slightly higher uh, density and it can be around 100 to 200 meter. So you must be wondering why densities are important because the you will realize as we, as we go further, reflectance characteristics of snow is significantly influenced because of the uh, density. So density of snow is very important and that is a key parameter in understanding how much water is stored into the snowpack. So if uh, it's a settled snow, that means the fresh snow snowfall has taken place and over a period of time, uh, there, uh, there is a change in a crystal size of fresh snowfall will take place. We will see that later on. And it over a period of time, because of compaction, it settles down and its density increases 200 to 300 kilogram per meter cube. Then what really happens is at the bottom of the snowpack, there's a significant amount of um, moisture and the temperature, because the, uh, if you really look into that, ice is a bad conductor of heat and because of that the uh, the, the bottom uh, of snowpack is relatively warm and there is a, some moisture on that and because of that it creates a certain amount of uh, thermal gradient into the snowpack we will look into that and that creates the depth hole so that has a slightly higher uh, density then wind pack if it is really very significant wind is taking place in that region then also it can increase to 350 to 400 kilogram per meter cube when the snow goes through the process of metamorphism and it is a transition between the snow and ice um, then it is known as fern uh, and it has uh, and also very wet snow and fur which can have between 400 to 800 or 830 um, uh, uh, kilogram per meter cube, it can have a, a ice density. And when it completely gets converted into the ice, then it is a density varies from 830 to 923 um, uh, 23, uh, kilograms. So that is how density keeps on changing as snow goes through the various processes as it has fallen onto the land. A uh, moment it's fallen onto the land, it gets converted into snowpacks and the snowpacks goes through the different uh, uh, changes and as it go through the different changes it converts in density and it it can go from 50 to 70 to 830 to uh, to 920 um, kilogram per meter cube depending upon the uh, condition so how what is once snow is deposited what are the uh, changes um, in a snowpack takes place, that is also very important to understand. So there are three, um, uh, four reasons by which snowpack goes through the its changes. So one important characteristic is water equivalent. So what is the water equivalent of snowpack? It changes over a period of time. Then its temperature is also causing. Uh, so if you really want to know what is the water equivalent of snowpack, you, you should know two fundamental characteristics of snow, uh, snowpack. One is the depth you should know and you should know the density. If you have depth and density, then it is possible for us you to get the water equivalent. 
Then what also happens is um, there is a, a temperature gradient inside the snowpack. And because of the temperature gradients, what it changes is, it changes its hardness, it changes its strength, the and it changes in grain shape, and it also changes in grain size. Um, so uh, all this thing and uh, and the liquid water content will also change because of all this thing. And it is it is very important to understand how much is the liquid water content in the snowpack. So uh, because of the temperature, there will be a change in various physical characteristics of snow. And these characteristics are hardness, strength, grain size, and uh, and grain uh, and grain shape. Uh, in addition to that, another important characteristic of snow is the albedo, and albedo is uh, significantly affected because of certain um, characteristics of the snowpack. And these are impurities. That means how much is um, is a clay content or um, black carbon, whatever way you want to say that impurities or soil, uh, which is on the snowpack, which is really reduces its albedo. The grain size can also significantly reduce the albedo, even though relationship is a square root relationship. But increase in grain size can also reduce the albedo of snowpack. And the liquid water content can also reduce the albedo of snowpack. snowpack. So these are the interlinked parameter and they influence various physical characteristics of um, snowpack. So it is important for us to understand some of these parameters are important, particularly hardness, strength and grain shape. Uh, and uh, these are important for us to understand how avalanches, because it changes the strength of snow and can lead to the avalanches. Albedo, uh, which is depending upon liquid water content, impurities, um, and grain size, uh, and uh, influences the melt of snowfall and the um, water equivalent is how much water is available if you want to do the hydrological analysis. Now, so in that question, all para parameters are important for us to understand and study the snow, ca uh, snow characteristics. So, the basic idea, you know that as snow has very low density and as it goes through the process and gets converted into ice, there is a significant change in the physical characteristic of snow takes place. And the change and that rapid change in various physical characteristic of snow is known as snow metamorphism. So it changes in grain size, shape, liquid water content, temperature and temperature gradient, all these things leads to densification of snow uh, and snow converts into, into ice and the process is known as snow metamorphism. So let us understand some of the things why it really happens. So let us look into the temperature gradient. One of the key parameters which influences the change in gray size because of the temperature gradient inside the snowpack. So um, if you look into generally Atmospheric temperature in the middle of winter is substantially low and it can go as low as minus 10, 15 degrees Celsius, 20 degrees Celsius or wherever you are, depending upon geographical location and numerous other conditions. However, if it is a thick snowpack, bottom of snowpack is rarely at uh, at the same temperature where top of snowpack is there. If atmospheric temperature is minus 10 degrees Celsius, then first layer of snow could be around minus six degrees Celsius. Then it is a minus three degrees Celsius. You can see here. And as you move down below the snowpack, the temperature of snow is significantly reduces. And when it comes to the interface between the land and snow, the temperature of snow is zero degrees Celsius. And it is quite, um, and because of that, there's a temperature gradient inside the snowpack and because of the temperature gradient, there is a change in the shape of uh, because of the um, uh, because of the uh, transfer of 
free moisture takes place between bottom to top, leading towards the change in the shape of the snowpack will takes place because of the temperature gradient. So there is also a change into the snowpack because of the diurnal variation in temperature. What it means is that um, it's quite possible that you can look here if you have around one and a half meter um, thick snowpack then there will be a daytime temperature will be substantially uh, high. It is around zero degrees Celsius. And then there will be a weight on the surface of snowpack. But remember, in the middle of winter, if there is a small melt is taking place in the surface of snowpack, that liquid water will not penetrate completely throughout the snowpack. It will penetrate up to certain level. In this case, it is penetrating only first 20, 30 centimeters. And then what will happen is the snow, which is melted here, get converted into ice. And this creates the exothermic reaction that energy is released, um, uh, uh, released, uh, released in the process that water is freezes. And the, so there is a temperature gradient. And then evening time, again, it freezes. Again, the surface goes very low and there is a temperature gradient is there. So there is a variation in diurnal uh, temperature gradient and creating a metamorphism process, which is a much stronger in active level, layer uh, in this. So uh, it's quite possible that many times mm, uh, when you see there, if this process is very routine and very strong, then top layer, the layer which we are talking here can become a ice lens. That means the melting, freezing, melting, freezing can generate the ice lens, lens there. And if there is a fresh snowfall on it, this becomes a slippery ground for future and it can create avalanches uh, in downstream. So this is also important for us to understand how the diurnal variation in temperature and its influence on uh, changes in snow characteristics are also very important. And that is, this is the precisely idea. If you can see here is, if temperature at bottom of snowpack is much warmer, and if the temperature on the surface is very low, and if you go into the region such as Arctic, where temperature could be as low as minus 30 degrees Celsius, but bottom is at zero degrees Celsius and much warmer. So this is the idea used in igloo. So this is one igloo. You can see here, you can, you can crawl inside the igloo and comfortably stay inside during night now when the outside temperature is minus 30, minus 40 degrees Celsius. You are comfortably at zero degrees Celsius. Sometimes they could be very spacious um, and could be very, um, I stayed a couple of days inside the igloo when I was a student at Magill and working in Schaeferville. Um, uh, remember, it's not a fun, uh, it, is, uh, it is a hard life over there, but important question is you can survive um, a night. Um, and then uh, when, when temperature is extreme, you can, you can, uh, so that's the, uh, you must understand, these are the, some of the survival skills you need to develop if you want to go into the high cryosphere region. Um, so uh, key question is, uh, now we have seen why does snow undergo metamorphism? And that is because close to, uh, if temperature is close to the, uh, melting point, then it becomes a thermodynamically unstable and it creates large surface to volume ratio. Therefore, large uh, surface free energy is available and it minimizes and therefore it becomes rounded and compact uh, and it gets compacted uh, to overlying layers. I think we will look some of the pictures so you will get the idea. So there are indeed various types of metamorphism. One is uh, the two predominant, the one is dry metamorphism. That means no liquid water present. Temperature is less than zero degrees Celsius and a solid state in equilibrium with vapor. And the wet snow is a liquid water pre presence and temperature is equal to zero degrees Celsius. So in a dry temperature, a dry metamorphism uh, is essentially driven by the water vapor movement into the pores. Water movement, uh, vapor movement is driven by vapor pressure gradient and which is controlled by temperature, 
radius of curvature and grave size. Uh, so we already know that many of you saturation vapor pressure depends upon temperature. Warmer area can hold more vapor than colder areas. Radius of curvature, how curvature, particular part of snow grain is increased. Radius of curvature and increase the vapor density and the grain size decreases. Uh, uh, so decreased grain size increases radius of curvature and therefore increases the vapor density. So this is the idea when it start it going to take into transformation so when you have a very fresh snowfall it is extremely dendritic in pattern if snow has fallen under calm condition uh, and uh, it is much more freezing temperature that means substantially below the zero degree celsius then you can have a beautiful picture like this um, which is a snow and it contains the 90 percent of air uh, when the snowfall snow fall is taken, it is a 90% of air and it has extremely high albedo. As the vapor pressure changes um, and it, it, it tries to shade the uh, dendritic pattern and it is become a more granular ice, then it becomes firm and it really becomes circular um, uh, when glacier ice is formed, that crystal change into the circular. So you have 50% of air when it is granularized, 20 to 30% of air when it is fur, and it is less than 20% of air bubble when it is gets converted into the uh, glacier ice. So that is how the metamorphic processes, and that is how snow gets converted into ice. So the so key question is, how long it takes um, for us, uh, for snow to get converted on the glaciers? whether it is Greenland, whether it is Vostok, Antarctica, whether it is in Antarctica, or whether it is Greenland. Remember, uh, so if, if you are in Greenland, then you have a depth at which snow uh, or a fern get converted into ice is approximately 65 to 70 meters. And it takes approximately 100 years and uh, the temperature, which is around minus 19 degrees Celsius, and uh, accumulation rate, uh, that means annually you receive approximately 490 kilograms per meter square per annum. That is how snowfall takes place. If you go into the Antarctica, it takes, it is that firm to ice depth is approximately 95 meters. And it takes 2,500 uh, years to convert snow into the ice. Remember one thing, how long it takes? 2,500 years. But accumulation rate is just 22 kilograms and the temperature gradient is, temperature is minimum minus 57 uh, degrees Celsius. And if it goes to the ice land, it is a 20 to 30 meter uh, and um, age is approximately within 10 years. So uh, you can see here that how long it takes. Key question is why it takes a, such a long time to convert a snow into ice, which is a 2,500 years in Antarctica, and it just takes the 10 years to convert into um, snow into ice in the Iceland. And it might be around 10 years in Himalayas too, uh, even though there is no systematic data for us to do that, but um, Iceland is also temperate glaciers like what is Himalaya, even though it is a little bit towards the polar side, uh, ours is uh, uh, slightly, but both are in mid-latitude uh, uh, region. So um, you can see that uh, it is, so think about it. You know, and uh, if you can find answer for this, uh, I have given um, answer for you. Look answer in in a in a certain way that what I have explained to you earlier. That uh, like uh, in order to convert snow into ice, it goes through the process of metamorphism. It means it needs either it can take the weight metamorphism or it can take the dry metamorphism 
or it also needs the compaction. So it has to meet three condition and uh, depending upon that, uh, snow gets converted into ice. So you can now from these three principles I have explained to you, you can really uh, uh, argue with yourself to find out why it takes 100 years in Greenland, why it takes 2,500 years in Antarctica, and 10 years in Iceland. Okay, I will not answer that question. I will leave you to, and if you, if you find it difficult to do that, uh, maybe we can discuss that a little bit tomorrow. So until now, we were talking about the physical characteristics of snow and ice. Now, key question is how we are going to find out these characteristics by using remote sensing technique. Um, we know that snow changes, um, its grain size changes, uh, its compaction changes, and we want to know that how it is going to change. So in this particular discussion, we will try and stick to ourselves uh, to the visible and near infrared band of electromagnetic spectrum. Even though uh, electromagnetic spectrum is wide and it has, it is starting from gamma rays to X-rays to ultraviolet rays, and then there's a visible part of spectrum, then the infrared microwave and radio waves. So many of these have been successfully used to estimate the characteristic of snow, including gamma rays, which is used because uh, it is a passive microwave sensor. So it is extensively used in North America, uh, which has very land mass. Uh, you have a background gamma ray radiation, then there is a snowpack, then it attenuates gamma ray radiation, so you can fly the um, gamma ray meter and then measure the attenuation and estimate the water equivalent. This is one of the techniques which is extensively used, but uh, gamma rays are very high frequencies, therefore you cannot use as a uh, as an active sensor, but this can be used as a passive sensor. And uh, uh, that is what yesterday Professor J. Srinivasan was talking about. Then, uh, then there are microwaves that are extensively used, and the radio waves are also extensively used to estimate the ground, um, estimate the depth of uh, glaciers, uh, which is a ground penetrating radar. We will visit that some other time. So today we shall talk about the visible part of spectrum which is a uh, which has a very um, uh, frequencies into uh, various uh, which is in blue green red of electromagnetic spectrum and then we will talk about the near infrared and short wave infrared also radiation in order to do that you know, so oh, yesterday we have you have seen that these are the various platforms of collecting the remote sensing information. Sometimes you can use the ground platform, you can use low altitude, aeroplane high altitude, then you can use the low altitude satellites and geostationary satellites. So all kinds of sensors you can use. But before going into the uh, uh, key parameters which determines how snow looks like on satellite images, it is important because we are talking about the visible and near infrared um, uh, part of electromagnetic spectrum and visible is a spectrum blue green and red that is a spectrum where eyes our eyes are sensitive uh, therefore how it looks like you can look into that one hand we have water you have a land uh, and you have a snow uh, here so they look quite different and obviously they will have a different reflectance characteristics and uh, what are their characteristics we will try and look into that so in a visible part of spectrum the reflectance of snow 
you can see this is snow it's very high this is a between 300 to 750 850 this is a part which is visible and 700 850 you can see in that band is around uh, is between blue green and red and near infrared band which has very high reflectance but the peak of reflectance you can see is which is around which is around 550 nanometer um, is uh, you have a peak of the reflectance so around 550 there is a peak of reflectance so uh, before that it is slightly less but overall if you look into the visible part of spectrum uh, which is the this spectrum which has very high reflectance as we go towards the higher wavelength uh, 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 that is uh, where the reflectors start reducing and it continues reducing till 1300 nanometer and around 1350 it becomes very low till 1800 and subsequently it becomes a very low reflectance after 1350 nanometer if you look in terms of other land feature if you look uh, because wherever there is a snow and glaciers, predominantly other land feature is a soil. So if you can look into the soil, here you can see this is a, this is a soil. You can see uh, this brown color soil. And soil has very low reflectance when it comes to the visible part of electromagnetic spectrum. You can see here, this is very low reflectance. It is around 0.1. And wherever snow has around 0.9 reflectance. And this is low reflectance. As you go towards the higher wavelength, it reflectance keep on increasing. And when it comes to 13, 1350 to 1550 or 1550 to 1750 nanometers, which is a uh, sphere, which is a short wave infrared region, the reflectance of reflectance of soil is very high compared to the reflectance of snow. So what it means is that in visible part of spectrum, you have a snow high reflectance and sphere part of spectrum, you have a snow which is low reflectance. And this relationship is exactly reversed when it comes to the soil. You can see the another land feature, important land feature is the vegetation. And you can see here vegetation, which is in greenish color. Uh, uh, so what is um, what really uh, 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 what is uh, is here you can see here is how reflectance is low in a visible part of spectrum you have a little bit peak here coming near green near green but still it is substantially low and then you have a red edge over here and then it has a near infrared radiation which is very high so it is still low uh, uh, it is uh, quite low compared to the snow in visible and near infrared. And it comes to the sphere part of spectrum. You can see the vegetation has relatively higher reflectance than the, um, uh, than the, um, than the snow. So this is very important for us to understand um, that. And another important question is, what is the reflectance of ice? So what happens is, the reflectance curve doesn't change as snow gets converted into ice. Here you can see the dark blue, which is the snow, and light blue, which is the ice. Ice is reflectance, but the magnitude of reflectance reduces. Even the curve remains the same, uh, same and its relative characteristic doesn't change. What it means is that it has high reflectance in visible range, and it has low reflectance in a, a sphere band. So this is how the characteristic of snow changes. And when we go into the snow cover monitoring by using, uh, by using um, the visible and near infrared band, which is quite often available, we will use this physical characteristic of snow quite significantly. We will dwell further on that. But why is it like that? So what is the optical properties uh, so if you of snow and ice which makes snow has visible part very high as it gets converted into ice its reflectance is low and other uh, and other characteristic of land features is different so what really happens so 
that any reflectance of object is fundamentally depends upon re, um, because of the uh, refractive indexes. And you know that, uh, many of you are aware that there are two refractive indexes. One is the imaginary part of refractive indexes and one is the real part refractive indexes. So optical property of our eyes is visible and near infrared wavelength, which is generally, uh, uh, if it is a, uh, uh, optical property of eyes visible and is absorption coefficient and uh, if you can really see here is imaginary part of refractive index you can see here that it is very low uh, it means 10 raised to minus uh, 10 imaginary part of refractive index to 10 raised to power minus 2 so it is very small that imaginary part of refractive index is very small, but its magnitude variation is very large. So at it, at it varies from 0.4 to 2.5 wavelength, it is very seven order of magnitude of, uh, so it changes minus 10, 10 raised to power minus 10, 10 raised to minus, two or minus three. So there, there's a significant amount of variation, but still it is very small. Um, so spectral variation in real part, uh, uh, part N is small and difference between ice and water may not be significant. What it really means, it has a lot of meaning. That means the snow and water doesn't have a significant change in the refractive index, mm -hmm. uh, particularly the uh, imaginary part of refractive index. Uh, that means uh, it doesn't get absorbed. It doesn't absorb any incoming solar radiation. Uh, and therefore, uh, you may not be able to separate between the snow and uh, snow crystal and water crystal. That is the idea we are seeing. An absorption coefficient K of ice and water is very similar, except region between 0.35 and point. So you can see here, 0.3 in this part of electromagnetic spectrum, there is a minor variation, but it's really very small variation. And uh, ice is slightly more absorbed there. Uh, so that's the idea. So visible spectrum K is very small and ice is transparent. If it is very small, and ice is transparent, then uh, then why snow looks very white? That is the question. Because if you have any object, if you put a glass uh, on any any surface, if you put a glass on any table, and the uh, table has a black top, and you put glass on it, and when you look through it, it will look you black, isn't it? Because uh, idea is it is very ice is transparent and the K, which is the absorption coefficient, is very small. So it doesn't absorb any incoming solar radiation and whatever incoming solar radiation is, is passing through as a transparent. So why it is white? That is an important question which we are going to address now. And that is because of interaction between the electromagnetic um, uh, radiation and ice crystal in a snowpack. What really happens is, as we have discussed, there is a ice or snow is aggregate of crystals, correct? And the in between that ice crystal, there is air. And as there is air, once solar radiation comes through, um, if, it, if it is comes through uh, in the contact, with ice crystal, either it will go through it, it will get reflected back. Some of this will go through the ice crystal and it, as it goes through the ice crystal, it will change its direction. Uh, it will change its, instead of coming this way, it will change its direction. As it comes out, there is again air in it. Mm. And when there is air in it, again, it will change its direction. So what will happen is there is a multiple scattering will take place. And as snow, uh, as there is more 
trapped air in between the ice crystal, there will be more opportunity for a diffraction will take place. And because of the change in direction and because of the forward scattering, snow will appear white. Uh, but as we start increasing density, as we remove the trapped air between the ice crystal, this opportunity for multiple scattering and forward scattering we are reducing and it reduces its, mm, it reduces its reflectance. So as snow gets converted into the ice, the significant amount of opportunity for multiple scattering uh, reduces and then converts uh, snow into ice because of the less air bubble and its reflectance characteristic reduces and its albedo is also reduced because of this thing. So it is important for us to understand why it is happening. Then there are different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum which is sensitive to the, uh, uh, to the different um, uh, different characteristic of snowpack. So let us look in terms of the, as snow, as we know that as snow go through the process of metamorphism, there are a couple of things happen to snowpack. Uh, and one of the key things happens to snowpack, we have seen, there's a change in grain size. When the snow is in early phases, it is in dendritic pattern, we have seen. And as it passes through the dendritic pattern to the circular one, when it completely gets you know, polycrystalline ice, there is a change in shape and there is a change in grain size. And which, which is an important characteristic of snow, because as it changes its size, uh, sizes, it can potentially lead to the avalanches. So as we look into the grain size changes, as, uh, as 0 0.05 to 0.2, 0.5 to 1 millimeter, this is the radius of grain size, you can see that certain part of electromagnetic spectrum is not at all sensitive. So if you look into the visible part of electromagnetic spectrum, which is between the 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and up to 0 0.7, they are not very sensitive to the change in grain size. But if you look into this part of electromagnetic spectrum, which is around 1100 nanometer, then there's a large difference uh, can be found. That means if it is very, it has very high albedo when it uh, reflectance when it comes to small grain size, and as the grain size increases, there is a reduction in um, a reduction in the snow um, uh, 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 snow reflectance. Uh, there are also, remember, remember this 1100 nanometer is a region of electromagnetic spectrum from this data appears to be sensitive to uh, grain size. Uh, uh, and next we will see what happens is contamination. That means what really happens is um, uh, as snow go through the process of melting um, and uh, then there is a lot of dust which is locally generated into the region and wind blows it and it flows uh, and it falls onto the snowpack mm, then there are certain other human act anthropogenic activity can also create certain amount of uh, certain amount of um, contaminants on the snowpack and it and its snow start melting it happens like a filtering process and and it gets accumulated on the surface so so what happens is its effect is the maximum. We will look into this slide and see that what really happens here is, if you see that there's a small increase in soot, that means if grain size is approximately 100 uh, micrometer and it is changes from, soot is changing from 0.5, um, you can see here that small increase in 0 0.01 parts per million by weight to 1 million, uh, parts per million and is the 10 parts per million and you can see that how change in reflectance will take place and that change in reflectance is predominantly in this part of electromagnetic spectrum which is 0 0.7 0 0.9 so the uh, region which is a uh, sensitive to the grain size which is around 1.1 is not significantly affected because of the contamination so now we have